You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Writing Black. I am your host, Maisha Kai, lifestyle editor of The Griot. And today we have with us a really spectacular guest who I'm personally excited about. You may know her from Family or Fiance. You may know her from her many, many writing credits, which include Mad Men, uh, United States of Terra, any number of TV shows. You may know her from her viral op-ed for HuffPost, Why You're Not Married, but... You should know her for her latest creation, which is Unprisoned, which recently debuted on Hulu, and it's fantastic, starring Carrie Washington and Delroy Lindo. Okay, so my dad is getting out of prison after 17 years, and uh, today's the day. Heaven help me! You ready to be on prison? Yes, sir. Oh, hallelujah! And I assume he'll be living with you. Oh, oh no, that's no good. Absolutely not. That's right. We have Tracy McMillan with us today. And thank you so much for joining us, Tracy, who is on vacation thank in Colorado. You. <laughs> thank you. You know, I'm happy to be here. I am absolutely thrilled to have you here. And not just because we have the same hometown, which is Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, that's right. That's right. I am a Minneapolis black girl, which, you know, we're our own special club. I <laughs> and. <was> gonna- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've had people say to me they don't know. They, I've had people say to me they don't know that there are black people from Minneapolis. And oh, yeah. I'm totally. like, we're there. We're all over. Right. And yeah. uh, I love that you incorporated, you know, that this story of all the um, things you've shared with us over the years. I mean, you've written memoirs. You've written uh, so, mu- so much content um, around uh, relationships and uh, those inc- incredible dynamics. This one is the one that, as I understand it, really gets to the heart of what made you you in terms of your own story. Um, so tell me about how creating this particular series, which is so good, uh, came to be. Well, let's see. Um, I mean, this is a story I've, you know, oftentimes when you are a screenwriter, there is one story, your passion project, one story that you came to tell, maybe more than mm-hmm. any other story. And that's what this is for me. And it's really the story of my own life. My dad was in prison most of my life. You know, I went into foster care at three and he was in and out. And then I went to, at one point he came out and I went to live with him and his girlfriend. And then he went back in and I stayed with her. So, you know, his most recent um, sentence was 19 years. So in Mm. that time I had a baby, you know, graduated from college, like started a career in New York and TV news and then went to, LA and wrote TV news some more. And then I got a screenwriting career. It's like a lot of stuff happened. And all that time, my dad had essentially been living inside my phone, you know, and we were close. We spoke often, but it wasn't in real life, you know, and as he was, as the clock was counting down on his prison sentence, I was like, wow, we're going to have to have an, you know, an IRL relationship. What is that going to be like? How am I going to do that? So for me, the way to work that out is to write about it. I think that you can stay with us for as long as you need. But obviously all the same rules still apply, right? You have to keep this job and... Don't ask you for money. Don't get in your business. Don't put the knife back in the jelly after I done licked it. Are you doing that? No, it's that, a joke. Is that, that was, something that you do? That was a joke. Baby. No. Do you want no. your own shelf no. in the... Cheers. Cheers. Are you contaminating I just said that. I just my said jelly? That, You're disgusting. And now I was writing... So I've been writing this story in different versions for since like 2007, since I first became wow. a scripted television writer. I'm very glad that this is the, the version that went... Um, all the other ones never got past the script stage, but they were all part of getting here, you know, because I don't know, this is, this is my story. I had, <laughs> you know, I always say to writers, you've got to go to where you are the least worked out, you know, the <laughs> places where you haven't worked it out. Cause if you've already worked it out, it's not a very interesting script. It's not a very interesting story. It's an interesting story if it's the thing you're like most conflicted about, most in shame around, most worried about, you know, about 
like this was the part of my story that I didn't want to tell anybody, you know? Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the writing of this is to work it out for myself and also to help other people work it out for themselves, you know? I mean, situation. I think that's been a through line in all of your work, um, at least that I've seen that I, I love about uh, you as a persona. I don't obviously know you as a person, but, you know, I think that uh, that 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 kind of like borderline therapist part. I mean, you are a relationship expert from your own experience. Um, and in this narrative, you make your lead character. You know, this this version of you is an actual therapist played by Carrie Washington, which is actually a, such a tremendous and vulnerable performance on her part in terms of how she's like um, allowed to be messy. Right. Um, I think we talk a lot about this or I talk a lot about this on this podcast about our ability to let our heroes and heroines and particularly our heroines, I think especially for black women, this becomes a thing to let them be messy because we are messy. Right. <laughs> you know? And I love that you did that. <laughs> well, I'm never, I'm much less interested in perfection than mm -hmm. I am in where the flaws are. Because the perfection mm -hmm. isn't what makes you human. The flaws are what make you human. Like, I don't, I, I don't need to see the Instagram feed version of you and your life. That is like, I get it. You curated it. It looks good. But I'm, I'm more like, I feel my humanity in places where other people show me theirs. So um, that's as a writer what I'm interested in, and it takes a it takes courage. But actually, once you realize, like this was part of my becoming unprisoned myself, was writing mm -hmm. into the places where I feared I couldn't be accepted or loved, or you know, isn't that what it's all about? Being messy is like if I show you the mess, you won't you won't love me, you won't think well of me, you won't like me. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that actually the connection that happens from showing people the flawed parts of you is so much stronger, you know? Actually, the perfection, showing perfection doesn't create connection. It creates idolatry, <laughs> you know? It creates, like, I mean, putting on someone that. up on a pedestal. But pedestals aren't good for people, you know? So uh, we are going to talk about that a little bit more. I want to talk about being this idea of being unprisoned because that was a term I had not... Um, actually thought about a lot, I, which is surprising as a journalist that I hadn't thought about this term of being unprisoned. I made it up. Yeah. Th th okay, good. I feel better because I was yeah. sitting there like, I have yeah. never heard this, but it's so appropriate. Yeah, no, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here to be here. <laughs> I love it. Um, but it is, you know, it, it ends up being both uh, descriptive and also aspirational in this in this context of what can you set yourself free from, even if it's your own perfectionism. <laughs> And I think that that's like such a huge lesson that we don't always get to partake in. And also this idea of, uh, you know, writing something as a series instead of a completed thing. Obviously, you know, when people we, we interview a lot of authors here, you've written books before. Um, and this idea of a, a narrative being complete, like this is the narrative arc. Um, so when we come back in just a second, I want to talk to you about the difference because you've written in so many different mediums at this point, which is such a rare treat for us to have here on this podcast, which talks about black writers. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the similarities and differences between kind of fleshing these stories out when we return with Tracy McMillan and more writing black. All right, we are back with Writing Black and Tracy McMillan, who's here to talk about her latest creation, the Hulu docuseries. Well, it's not a docuseries, excuse me, it's a dramedy, actually, is what I would call it. Dramedy series, uh, Unprison, which stars Kerry Washington and Delroy Lindo, both giving amazing performances, as well as the young co-star whose name is escaping me right now, Jordan, who plays... Jordan uh, McIntosh. Thank you. You know, these portrayals are so... Uh, so great and so relatable because they are they're hitting all the notes right they're hitting everything that we want we hit in in our lives you know we, they hit the humor the humor and the ridiculousness and the resentment and the um pain the regrets the unresolved things right um you as you just noted for for us you know you started in tv news which you know is a, obviously has a very <laughs> Similar place in my life, you know, and I'm also the daughter of a TV news writer and producer, so I get it. Um, you transition that into a screenwriting career, which I think a lot of people would love to know how that happened. We have so many aspiring screenwriters out there. And then, you know, 
obviously there's a world of difference between um, you've also written books, you know, but this idea of like shifting between these, these mediums and these genres, um, how has that functioned for you? Was it, has it been a steep learning curve? Was it just kind of something that you just, do you just jump in? How has that worked for you? Well, I love the challenge of working in a new medium Mm -hmm. um, or a new format. Mm -hmm. So I started in television news, which is like the world's greatest writing background. And (laughs) because, you know, agreed, (laughs) you you just you learn to do it because it needs to get done. Mm -hmm. Not because you were inspired or (laughs) because it's the job. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, what did I I remember reading one of my textbooks um, in journalism, I, cause I have a degree in broadcast journalism. He said, don't get it right. Get it written. Mm-hmm. Like in other words, you can go back and make it perfect later, but right now you just need to get it down because whatever it's going on the air in like four minutes or whatever. So yes. I think don't get it right. Get it written is a mantra for me. It is about yeah. getting it down. You can, you, you just need that first draft of anything. So that was one thing. And then that allowed me to kind of try out other other ways of writing. So when I first wrote, um, so I always wanted to write television, but I didn't know anybody. I didn't really know how it was done. I wasn't living in the right place. Uh, I remember being eight years old and going, I have an idea for a TV show. I wonder if I wrote a letter to ABC if they would get it. And then I was like, no, they wouldn't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not going to. Mm-hmm. They'll just go to some slush pile of mail somewhere. So, um, but it's interesting to me. But that to know I that it ate is a big thing. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Well, I was very realistic because I've been through so much realism yeah. in life. I, I kind of yeah. knew the difference between what was, what I thought was possible or, you know, I had a clear idea of the world, even at a pretty young age. Mm-hmm. So. But I think it's interesting that I had the thought. Then I was like, hmm. And I look back on that many, many decades later and went, wow, I always knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know that I knew what I wanted to do, but I did always know. And I remember having another thought around screenwriting after I graduated from college. But I was like, how would I do that? What, I'm just going to move to L.A. and start like cold calling studios? That I don't. I had no idea how to go about it. And I thought that... You know, there's a lot of gatekeepers in um, yeah. writing scripted television. It's a very, you just need to get, I mean, people say this, you have to get lucky, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I, 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 that's a hard thing. I knew one person and that one person said, well, here's how you do it. For a sitcom, you have a character and they have a problem and they try to solve it and they get up the tree and then they try to solve it again and they get further up the tree and then they try to solve it again and they fall out of the tree and that's your 30 minutes that come and I was like hmm so I took that and I went this is in 2000 and I wrote two two different spec scripts one Dharma and Greg and one Drew Carey show and I showed them to her. And she was like, first of all, wait, you didn't even do one, you did two? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because I come from TV news. <laughs> I crank out, I crank it out. Yeah. You know? yeah. I will say I write more than probably, uh, I'll, I write a lot. I write a lot. I write every day, pretty much. I mean, I, mean, I could say so much about this, you guys. I don't want to get too caught up in the details. But here's what happened. She looked at those two scripts and she said, everybody thinks they can do this, but you actually can now I wasn't ready. But then four years later, when I was going through a life crisis and I was trying to write my feelings, um, I wrote a, a feature and that became my calling card. That feature um, got me, I gave it to her and she said, I'm much too busy because um, her career had kind of blown up in the meantime. I'm way too busy, but I'll give it to my agent. If he likes it, he'll call you. And if he doesn't like it, he won't. And so eight months later, he called me. And I wasn't good at following up. I wasn't, but whatever. Eight months later, he called me. And that was the beginning. He's like, this is really good. And you should come in and meet with me. And that's that was 2006. And I didn't get my first job until, that was February of 2006. I got my first job in June of 2007. So it was an incredibly okay. long process. And in that time, as soon as I met with the agent, I started 
writing. I gave myself assignments. I'm going to write a sexy thriller. Mm-hmm. I'm going to write a half hour. I'm going to write an hour long, like, um, you know, free form kind of YA type of show. I'm going to do the, you know, and I just started cranking it out. One script is not going to get you a career. Nope. It can open a door, but what the door, like all an agent cares about is do, what, what can I sell? So if you only have one script, that's, that's not going to do it. You need to be having stacks of scripts, you know, and I know that's hard to imagine for me. It was anyway, in the beginning, how am I going to do that? But I think when you uh, align yourself with whatever is like the writer in you, I've had a pretty steady flow of ideas for 17 years. I've never run out yet. I mean, you know, like that's to, to, for our read, for our listeners, excuse me. You know, I, I think that's a bit of a masterclass on like how to get this done. I think so many people wonder, and I love that you just gave us so much insight because also at the core of that is like patience. Um, but we're going to talk more about that and, and more about unprison uh, when we return in a second with more writing black. We are back with Tracy McMillan and more writing black. We were just talking about, listen, Tracy just gave us a total download on her incredible trajectory. And and granted, everybody's trajectory is not going to be the same, but I love what you said about um, writing every day, having stacks of scripts, you know, I think so, so often we're so goal oriented. We're so like looking at, you know, the, the, the goalpost and, and that goalpost is constantly moving as we know, um, that we don't think about just doing the work for work's sake, or we think that doing the work for work's sake is a waste of time. And if, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I was hearing from you is that you were perfecting a craft even before you had a place to put it. Oh yeah. I mean, if you're not doing it for free, like I would do this for free. Mm. When you write like that, what it does is it makes you a writer. So now you're yeah. not like trying to become a writer. A be- you're you're being one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so even then when I was taking meetings and moving through the world, it didn't feel like I was lying to someone about this. It didn't feel like I was like puffing myself up or trying to do something. And I had a lot to talk about in terms of writing. I wasn't like... I I didn't just have like one product I'm trying to sell. I'm like talking Mm -hmm. about the process of writing in my meetings and uh, the things that I want to write and the, you know, the, the bigger ideas that I'm connected to, which is where my material is going to flow from. And you can see like, it was all about relationships. This is like back Mm -hmm. in 2006, 2007, it was all about relationships. It was about families. It was about black families and every single thing. It was about generational trauma and how that our relationships and every single thing I've done is a piece of that you know yeah I think that is that is fascinating to me too like this idea of working across so many different mediums but at the same time your brand you know because people love to talk about their brands now you were doing all this before we even knew what black twitter was because it it didn't exist yet right but like you know and and I'm I'm a gen xer so for me I'm like yes that was a simpler time and place you know (laughs) but I, I I think That is fascinating to me, too, this sense of identity that is so strong within you as a writer, that no matter what you're writing, it's still very true to you. You know, even if you're not writing, if you're appearing on Family and Fiance, like it's all very consistent with who you have shown us that you are and what you want to talk about. I have a purpose and my purpose is helping people heal. And so it's like. It's and it's all relational. So and then mm-hmm. I mean, I'll just say it like this: God tells me what to do. I'm like, go do this TV show, write that essay, do that book, do that other book, and then the the messages just come. Like even now, you know, now I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do next. Hopefully, we're gonna mm-hmm. do a season two of Unprison. I but hope like, so. I was gonna ask. <laughs> well, this is my passion project. So like, yeah. What what would I do after this? But then if you keep your eyes and ears open. I had two people in 24 hours, this is just a few days ago, tell me, you know, you have another book in you. And then both of them, these are completely uh, not anybody related to each other. They were like, yeah, it feels like it should be essays. And then it feels like the essays should be things that you turn into your next show. And I was like, boom, that's it. So it's like the messages come and I'm like, that's it, you know? And suddenly now my mind Mm -hmm. is going, that's an essay, that's an essay, that's an essay things that I just think about all the time that I want to talk about, you know? 
and things I'm trying to work out for myself. This is the key. What mm -hmm. are you trying to work out for yourself? That's where your material is because we teach what we need to learn, you know? And if the, if you're not in it in that way, it's not interesting. <laughs> You know. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, we are going to get into this a little bit further. We'll be right back with more Writing Black. We are back with Tracy McMillan, uh, who is, listen, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting my own masterclass in writing right now. And, and I love it because I think that that's what this is all about. If you love to write, you never want to stop learning about writing. Um, and this is so fun for me. Um, I want to talk about the inner child, right? There is an inner child character in Unprisoned who, uh, first of all, is absolutely delightful uh, and hilarious <laughs> and so well cast. But also, you know, we all have one, right? And we're all reckoning with this inner child, so to speak. However, you know, whether you're into therapy or not, I'm sorry. Yeah, as my mother would say, you may not be ready to deal with it, but it's going to deal with you. Um Tell me about this character and why she's so important. Well, I've been in therapy my whole life, basically. And, um, you know, at a certain point, you you are introduced to the idea of the inner child. Now it's now it's just like in the culture. But and then I started to really develop a relationship with my inner child. Like she became a real person to me. She was me. And she was me, the part of me that had never been abused had never been abandoned had never who was my uh, most authentic self mm -hmm. um, who knew every piece of my consciousness and knew what was right for me and was trying to communicate with me if I would only listen <laughs> and so once I started really interfacing with that part of me and imagining for example in a relationship sense she's on the date with me and I would look at her not really, but really, and go, what do we think about this? And she'd be like, no. <laughs> and then you're like, and in the olden days, before I was really in a good relationship with her, I'd be like, shh, I'm trying to do something over here. You know what I mean? And then I started to partner with her because it was basically taught to me that I needed her if I was going to fulfill my gift in the world because she's holding it. She's the essence of it, mm. the truth. For me and so when it came time to do the show I was like well we got to deal with the inner child but what if we actually personified the inner child and then that that would be such a great moment for comedy if we actually dressed her exactly as Paige the main it's character. hilarious it's hilarious yes. and then we cast this amazing human being who's the evolved version of all of us and um who is <laughs> that person who is so mm -hmm evolved like wise authentic real self-loving i mean jordan mcintosh is that and um <laughs> and you know she teaches us all every day like she does not respect um anything fake you know what i mean like she just is equal to everything and everyone and that's what it's about when you can really come to that spot and live there and protect that part of you and operate, make choices from that piece. Boom. Mm -hmm. The whole world opens up. And that's been my experience. I love it. And so I wanted to put it in the show. And, you know, I think you're opening up worlds for people who are watching this show. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more in just a second. We'll be back with more Writing Black. All right. Um, Tracy McMillan is with us today on Writing Black. And is amazing as I predicted she would be. I'm so excited. Um, listen, I have no problem fanning out on this podcast. It's partly why I created it. But, um, you know, one of the reasons that I was so excited to talk to you today is that, you know, and you were just talking about, you know, this, this idea of like authenticity and kind of like grabbing on to, um, obviously the things that, that make us hurt, the things that have wounded us, all these kind of things. Um, I think there's also obviously a very powerful message here to uh, black women. I think it's so interesting that this is set in um, our joint hometown of Minneapolis, which I think is a black woman in Minneapolis. You know, uh, there are a lot of racial dynamics there uh, to reckon with, not all of which are, you know, negative or, or racist or, you know, anything like that. It's just we are we are 
our own breed there. It's it's not it's not a it's not a chocolate city. Let's put it that way. It's a very specific experience to grow up there. Um, <laughs> I'm like I'm gonna leave it there and let you say the rest. I'm like, but, especially on this part of town. Where are you from? What part of town? Um, so I grew up uh, in, mostly in North Minneapolis, and now my my parents are right outside the Twin Cities. But yeah, so I there was there were places I recognized here, you know, and like you know, where I was just like, oh my gosh, did we live there when I was a kid? It looks just like this is down the block. Um, yeah, you know, I I do think that like there was a what I loved about how you played with race in this particular um, production was so artful. Hey, this is like a field trip, but interesting. You know, when I meet other black kids, they don't always know. Like, it's just weird to go up and be all like, hi, I too am black. Don't say it like that, Finn. That sound kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's facts, though. You know, I just feel like I have to prove that I'm black. Let me tell you something. If any of blackness to other black people, that's one of the blackest things you can do. You know, from the uh, Korean foster sister to the Lutheran, you know, like it was so very true to place. And we talk a lot about world building on the podcast. And I think that's another level of authenticity that I would love to explore with you because you took a place that a lot of people are not familiar with. You know, like some people think of Minnesota as a flyover state. It, for us, it's home, you know, um, and you made it you brought it alive in a very like for me the racial dynamics were very authentic um can we talk about that a little bit like how you how did you sell those choices even to people who didn't get it oh, you you never, they, i remember when well i mean they were first of all uh, biographical you know i lived yeah. with a lutheran family and i had a korean foster sister and we're still very close i'm still very close mm -hmm. to my um foster family because they were like well and i was like well i want to make the her sister a character in the show and I want to have this foster family be part of the show and they they were all like yes 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 because a great network executive and we have great executives so um I'm part of Hol Onyx Collective which is a premium mm -hmm. black content for black creators at Vertical within Hulu and Tara Duncan runs it and she's a gifted network executive I expect her to run the world and he, she's already running my world <laughs> I love it and she also is president of Freeform at the same time. Mm -hmm. And she is a visionary and she just gets it. And so when I was saying these things, she was like, oh, I love the specificity, you know, because there's, you couldn't really make up that stuff. That, right. that wouldn't go there. It just wouldn't occur to you. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, these, the racial dynamics are, you know, what I lived, you know, um, mm -hmm. being a, what a young girl of color in a completely white world. I'm from the whitest part of Minneapolis, which is a incredibly white city. <laughs> yeah. In an yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, um, and especially I'm I'm older than you. It was even more white when I was little. Like I remember the Minneapolis of my really young, like four, five, six, seven, eight. It was just it was Scandinavia. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, what was that like navigating those dynamics? And a lot of it, I'm figuring out now. You know, mm -hmm. like I look back on how my experience with teachers, for example, and there was something about me that they were just like, oh, I don't know why this little girl gets under my skin the way she does. And I'm like, precocious. Well, I was one of those kids too. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I wasn't acculturated as a white girl. So I wasn't yeah. doing white girl things that they were expecting me to do that what everybody, every other girl in the school is acting this way or behaving in this manner or making these assumptions. And I just didn't even know any of those rules because it wasn't, it really wasn't my reality, you know? Um, so like mm -hmm. I didn't have a dad who came home from IBM every day who taught me how to make a male teacher feel comfortable I didn't know any of that you know I'm yeah. coming from I'm like a wild animal but also also kind of like free in this one way you know I'm not following the rules of Minneapolis um a lot of the time um so 
these are dynamics that I'm looking back at and learn, you know, really realizing how that was and why that was in retrospect. But of course, it was incredibly freeing because I didn't have to, I really didn't have to follow the rules in certain ways. They didn't expect me to. And um, yeah, I mean, was I was not a straight A student or anything like that. But uh, so there were advantages that were lost to me in that process, but there were also... Um, there were also advantages given to me. I think I got to be more kind of creative and think outside the box because nobody expected me to be in the box. They looked at me and said, who's this? You know, I don't know what's going on with you, you know, because I'm like the only brown face in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about it is that when you're brown in Minneapolis, you're even browner because if I'd grown up yes. like, my, like my friends in Southern California, not even a thing there, not even a thing. Right. All sorts, you've got all kind of company of different yeah. you know, ethnic groups and people are used to it, you know, but in it's true. Yeah. And even the colorist dynamics are different. I mean, I grew up on the, I grew up in North Minneapolis and the South side of Chicago. And let me tell you who I was on the South side of Chicago in relation to everybody else and who I was on the North side of Minneapolis. Totally, totally different. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. In Minneapolis, yeah. you're like yeah. super dark in the South side of Chicago. Yeah. You're, you're, like you're definitely, yeah. You a black person and that's it. And yes. that's, you're, you're totally othered one way and then you're othered the other way yeah. when you're in a predominantly that's black environment. Yeah. It is. It is. It really is. And I think that's what makes your story and this story so fascinating and why I'm so glad that it's making it to so many people. We're going to take one final break and then we'll be back with Tracy McMillan and Writing Black. We are back with Writing Black and our guest today, Tracy McMillan, who is amazing. I'm again, I, I love this. Um, I, I, again, it falls in line very much with uh, who we know you to be as a public person, that you are giving so much valuable advice to writers who aspire to do the things that you have done and are doing. Um, you've already talked a little bit about what's next for you and including I think all of us who have engaged with unscripted, not unscripted, excuse me, in prison. Um, you know, like my mother, for instance, like accosted me yesterday when I saw her and was like, have you watched on prison yet? It's so fantastic. You know, so I, I think oh, that, really? you know, you're hitting people, you're hitting a lot of people, uh, a mean. lot of different generations with this story. But well, we do recommend parolees live with family to give them the best chance of staying out. Yeah, no, of course, that makes sense. But I, I only have two rules. And one of them is that he cannot live with me. The other yeah, is don't, don't ask, ask me for money. money. Uh, I had to share that with you because I think it's important. She did that unprompted. She did not know I was interviewing you today. And I told her and wow. she was like, oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> so there you go. You've got a fan. Uh, so we Nothing. are hoping for a season two. And you've already yeah. said that you uh, are already percolating on a book of essays. Um, what other things do you aspire to do, though? I mean, you've done so much already in okay. your career. You're <laughs> and you still got hopefully miles to go. So what well, else would I'm you like to do? Well, one of the things I want to do is I want to um, be part of creating a conversation about healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's somewhere in there, there's got to be a food pyramid of healthy relationships. Like, you know, before we had the food pyramid, we, yeah. we didn't really know what, what, a, what a good diet was. You know, now we know this many grains, vegetables, boo, boo, boo. We know. Everybody knows it. Well, what if we had that for relationships? That's something I want to do is because I feel like people just make it up as they go or they just do whatever their parents did. And that yeah. doesn't, that, there's actually a, quite a bit of like actual science on what mm. creates healthy, a healthy relationship and like um, secure attachment. And I mm -hmm. would like to put, move some of that science into the front. And if it, I know you said you watch Family and Fiance, and that's something that I'm always. Listen, we watch all of them. We watch Married at First Sight. We watch all of them. So I'm interested in this too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well Beyonce, I'm always saying to these couples, like, there are actual things if you do them, your relationship will be better, period. Mm -hmm. And there are actual things if you do them, you will probably head toward a divorce, period. It's just science. Like, it's it's numbers. So uh, these are the kinds of things that I, I want to put more and more into the culture. I also want to write, um, like, a good novel or maybe even a great one that sounds like a fun thing to do but that's going to have to be when i'm not writing television because yeah it takes an incredible i've written one novel it was okay but i know i could do better it takes an incredible amount of bandwidth to write a novel mm -hmm. um i don't know i think there's other things i want to do in terms of um television you know um 
I mean, my dream, crazy dream would be like, I want to host a game show because I love game shows. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I would totally take you as the new host of the dating game. I think that I think or I the, mean, or what is it? A newlyweds game? You would be amazing. I <laughs> love it. OK, let's say it's amazing. Good. Let's put it out into the universe. Yeah. We just did. <laughs> We just did. I love it. I love it. I love it. I also forgot to shout out one other point that you did. This this is, you know, listen, how much you had to do with this or not. I don't care. The fact that Terry Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam did the soundtrack for Unprisoned set in Minneapolis. Huge. Just totally. Huge. That was that just was my Minnesotan heart was just all the way Mind like banging for that. Mind amazing show. soundtrack, y'all. It's on Spotify. Go get it. It's like it, watch the show. Get the soundtrack. I've done the whole thing. Um, and lastly, you know, uh, since you have been so gracious to to join us while you were on your vacation of all things, who inspires you? Like, who do you read? Who do you watch? Um, who excites you, I guess, uh, you know, living or or not not living anymore um, in the world of words and in, in across the genres? I'm a, I'm a real nonfiction person. Like I tend to I want to learn. That's my thing. So I read a lot of like textbooks. <laughs> I read a lot of attachment textbooks. I mean, there are some, they're not writers. They're, um, you know, professors essentially, or like scientists. So those would be mm -hmm. people like Stan Tapkin, Dan Brown. Like these are not, but these are not writer things. These are things about, I mean, I guess this is what I would say is, as a writer, it's not that you need a brand that's such a word that's been overused. It's that you need a thing that you're bringing, whether it's to the writer's room or the marketplace. It's like, what is the thing that you can do that no one else can do? That's where you need to become more, even more. And my thing that I bring into a writer's room that I bring into the world is my knowledge of relationships. Mm -hmm. It's not even my skill as a writer. I'm a good writer. But what am I writing about? That is, that's what being a writer is. It's being a person who knows a bunch of stuff and shares it and finds a way to artfully share it. So I, I spend most of my reading and listening time on my spiritual stuff and my learning. And so that is what I would say more that that's where I get my inspiration. That's where my ideas are coming from, the things I'm learning. And then what I offer as a writer is, I think about those things and I offer a point of view that no one else has developed because I don't know, I don't know, they, they got put in me and, and we all have something that's put into us that we are here to give. So um, to me, great writing is the quality of your ideas, bottom line. It's like, do you the have new ideas? Is. Are you telling me new things I haven't heard? Are you telling me things I've heard and spinning them in a new way? You know, uh, like um, an example from, and prison would be like, no, because I remember realizing like, oh, you lie to the person you care about. <laughs> like that is, and then it, you hear that and you're like, yeah, you, if you, if you didn't care about them, you wouldn't be lying to them. Is that great? No. Is it true? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, I'm interested in you taking whatever it is that you think about the most, your obsessive thing, the thing you're trying to heal in yourself. Mm. And then having new ideas and then giving them to me. That's why I want to read your book, read your screenplay, watch your show, you know? So my job as the writer is to develop all that stuff within myself so that my show is interesting and tells, you know, helps people see the world in a new way. I, well, I, you certainly have succeeded at that with uh, Unprison, and I would dare say your other works as well. So thank you so much, uh, you. Tracy McMillan, for joining us today, for giving us so much insight and wisdom, and for so much amazing food for thought, uh, both on this podcast and in your work. Everybody go check out Unprison on Hulu. Excellent performances, excellent script, so, so relatable. And uh, hopefully this will not be the last time we talk to Tracy McMillan here on Writing Black. All right. Well, that was an amazing conversation with Tracy McMillan. I uh, personally learned a lot and I hope that you did too. Uh, this is the segment of Writing Black that I always love to call my favorites because it's based on recommendations I have, typically based on the guests that we entertain each week. And this week, 
you know, Tracy bringing her own story to the screen made me think of another um, incredible life story that was brought to the screen recently, which was From Scratch by Timby Locke. Where are you from? Texas. I came here to experience art, to try things I may never get to again in my life. Me chiamo Amy. Sei americana? Sì. Allow me to cook for you at my restaurant. I express myself through food. I get that. This started as a memoir of Tembi's own love story with her husband, um, who her late husband, unfortunately. And we saw it brought to the screen uh, at the end of last year with Zoe Saldana in the lead. And uh, she developed that project with her sister, Attica Locke. So when we talk about, you know, a moving between uh, platforms and genres and mediums, um, this is a classic example of something that started as a life experience and became a memoir, which, you know, is cathartic in its own way as a writer, um, and then made its way to the screen where it could, you know, bring this incredible love story and uh, sense of catharsis and, and relatability to millions of viewers, potentially. So uh, I highly recommend uh, Unprison. I also recommend From Scratch. These are two stories written by black women that I think really tap into humanity and uh, the power of love and to a certain extent redemption. So I hope you enjoy them both. And I hope we'll see you next week for another episode of Writing Black. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. Yo, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter, come get your man. This man's got no chill, and I love it. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is the Grio Daily. He goes off too on white supremacy, politics, and the erasure of our history. South Carolina was a majority black state. Just think about what would happen if all of those enslaved people rebelled at once. No trolls, no cap, just facts. I don't have any evidence that good cops exist. Nah, we need the police. I feel you, but let them cook. Every single police officer works for an institution that was founded in the beginning to oppress black people. How? am I just learning this? I'm telling you, this man knows his history, like our real history, not the whitewash stuff. Let's talk about the other Thomas Jefferson that no one ever talks about, right? By any measure, he was a racist. Why weren't we taught this? We gotta find the real tea for ourselves. Every black child in America lives in a separate country than the white privileged children. When Michael spits the truth, he helps us understand it. Plus, I can use it to shut down the Karens. You have to study white people because they are the ones who created all of these disparities. He's the real deal. And his podcast is wising us up. That's right. The Black Twitter King has a podcast. Like the man said, no trolls, no cap, just facts. The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Griot Black Podcast Network and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard.